Hello and welcome to the next episode in the series on GPU programming. I started this out as an episode on constant memory. And in the middle of it, I realized that explaining the concept of a warp and a streaming multiprocessor will make things a lot easier. And while trying to get to the streaming multiprocessor, I ended up going through the full architecture of a modern GPU. And I do feel like that historian that wanted to tell you about Hiroshima, so he starts with Julius Caesar, just to give you some good context on the events leading up to it. Anyway, this episode will be focused on the architecture of the modern GPU. We touched on this subject before in the first episode, where we've shown a highly simplified architecture of a GPU. We outlined that there are thread groups that share control units, and those are streaming multiprocessors, the core components of our GPU. But, as you might imagine, the actual GPU architecture is much more complicated, and do take everything with a grain of salt. A lot of the details are not released to the public, and the information is very often stitched together out of multiple blog posts, official architectural white papers, NVIDIA forum discussions, and third-party microbenchmarks. Most of it is true, and we do have some high-quality die shots, like the one on the screen, to confirm it, but small details might be missing or wrong. As I've shown in the episode on memory, on the actual PCB we have our DRAM memory and a chip that does the calculations. The PCB obviously contains much more components, like power circuits, voltage controllers and all that beautiful stuff that I am going to omit. I bet there are a lot of electronics nerds here that would love to hear all about this stuff, but I'm also sure that they would be outraged by my lack of knowledge on the topic. I am going to take the AD102 chip as a reference for this video. This is the chip that is in the 4090 and some other cards from the ADA architecture. The core logic is the same, but there are minor details changing from architecture to architecture, so keep that in mind. So. Our chip contains the L2 cache that is shared between all cores. If you are not familiar with caches, they are a type of fast SRAM memory, much smaller than our main DRAM. When we access DRAM memory, some of it gets stored in the fast cache. So then, when we want to access it later, we don't have to wait for it again. I realized that this was a brief description but cache is so complex that it would need an episode on its own to explain it in detail. If you are interested in the topic, let me know in the comments and I might make one in the future. Our chip also contains 12 memory controllers that handle data transfers between the layers of memory. Another part of our chip are the graphic processing clusters, GPCs for short. In the case of AD102, there are 12 of them on a chip, and each one contains 6 texture processing clusters, as well as some components for rasterization, namely the raster engine that generates pixel information from triangles, and 16 render output units divided into two raster operation partitions. Going further down into our texture processing cluster, we can see that it's composed of a polymorph engine, another component used for computer graphics. It handles things like vertex fetching, tessellation, viewport transforms, attribute setups, and stream outputs. But more importantly to our use cases, it contains two streaming multiprocessors. Let's zoom in on our SMs. It contains a ray tracing core a dedicated hardware unit for ray tracing operations. We also have four texture units that perform operations on textures. 
128 kilobytes of SRAM memory divided into L1 cache and shared memory. The fact that both use the same memory is very important for us. It tells us that the more shared memory we use, the less L1 cache we have available. We have 8 kilobytes of special cache for accesses to constant memory. It's worth mentioning that one group that microbenchmarked the Volta architecture also mentioned that there is a 1.5 level constant cache, but I'm unable to find any confirmations for it in the official sources. And finally, our SM also contains four processing blocks. Inside our processing blocks, we can identify the smallest components that execute our instructions. Per processing block, we have 16 CUDA cores that are capable of running FP32 operations, another 16 cores that can execute either FP32 or INT32 operations. It also contains a tensor core. This is a specialized unit for performing matrix multiplication and accumulation operation. CUDA programming guide, as well as some architectural white papers, also mention that there are two FP64 cores per SM. I'm not outlining them here because it's not really clear where they reside. I doubt that they are outside processing blocks, but there are more processing blocks than there are FP64 cores mentioned. Are not all processing blocks the same size? Do some have FP64 cores disabled? It's really impossible to tell without doing some sort of photon screening of the chip. So, we have 32 CUDA cores available for computation. This brings us to an idea of a warp. When we actually launch our kernel grid, all of the blocks inside are further divided into collections of 32 threads that our processing blocks can execute. The spread collections are called warps. You might have heard a mantra to always have your blocks be a multiple of 32 threads. This is the reason. Since the blocks are divided into warps, we might have a situation like this, where our last warp only has 8 threads executing, leaving 24 threads idle while they could be doing some work. Warps take us to two control components, that is the warp scheduler and a dispatch unit. The division of work between the two is one of those stitched together from different sources type of information. So I might be wrong on some of the details. All of this happens, but it's not exactly clear which component does what part of the work. As I read the literature, the warp scheduler assigns and manages warps that are executed by a processing block. So, for example, when one warp is waiting for a data fetch from global memory, the warp scheduler might perform a context switch and transfer control to another warp until the first one is ready to resume. This further hides latency and speeds up execution, and the dispatch unit dispatches the instructions that our warps will execute. Another control component inside our processing block is an instruction cache. It works similarly to our data cache, but instead of data, it caches instructions to be executed by our threads. A processing block also contains a 64 kilobyte register file that holds the data inside our registers. Four load store units that control our memory access instructions. And I'm going to go with four special function units. They perform functions for graphic interpolation, as well as trigonometric and transcendental operations. So, functions like, for example, a logarithm function, sine, cosine, etc. You might have also noticed that I've said that I'm going to go with four SFUs. That's because there is a bit of an ambiguity in this area. Because if you look at the programming guide from NVIDIA, they mention 16 SFUs per SM. 
So four per processing block. But the official ADA architecture white paper claims there is only one. And if you look at the figure, they draw it as one SFU made out of four elements. Again, a lot of the architectural stuff is barely mentioned, so we have to take all of this with a grain of salt. This is it. We covered all of the components that are mentioned throughout the architectural white papers, and some that are omitted. I'll repeat myself once more, but as I said in the beginning, due to competitive advantages and many other factors, not everything is described in detail, and a lot of details are omitted or obfuscated. So do treat it like a history lesson, not as a gospel. The key and the most important ideas are definitely there, but some details get conflicting evidence. I've recently started a Buy Me A Coffee page for those that want to support this channel. A shout out to Alex and two anonymous donors that support it so far. But you can always support me without spending a pack by subscribing, leaving a like, commenting and sharing this video with your friends. And as always, I'll see you in the next episode. Bye.